Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. We're asking questions like, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to this world, light in this present darkness, and a tool in the hand of God, bringing his kingdom to pass, not someday, but today and every day, and that's what this show's all about. Got a good show for you today. Glad you could join us. It's all about the end of the world. It's all about judgment. But before we get into it, it is time for viewer mail. Our letter today coming from Paul in Indiana. Dear Father C, a smile to start your day, a prayer to bless your way, a song to lighten your burden, and a hug to wish you a great day. God bless. Paul. Well, I love that letter. And he always he puts in like little quotes here. A champion is someone who gets up when he can't. That's Jack Dempsey. He's a fighter. But he also sends me corny jokes, and I love the corny jokes. When I was young, I used to watch The Wizard of Oz and wonder if someone could really talk if they didn't have a brain. And then I discovered social media. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Speaking of, daily living is entering into the pool. We're, 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 we're taking a dive into social media and we are beginning our first Facebook page. Daily Living. First and only. You can go there right now. But what do you say we talk about this gospel? And I've got my gospel book upside down. We are hearing from the gospel of Mark. Jesus said to his disciples in those days after that tribulation, the sun, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from the sky and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky. Learn the lesson from the fig tree. When its branch becomes tender and sprout leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, know that he is near at the gates. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. The gospel of the Lord and what a gospel it is. My friend, this is a deep pool calling the kids. It's going to be good. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. You hang out. We'll be right back. And we're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things along the way here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm gonna share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living, and together, we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. So today we are talking about the end of the world. A fascinating subject for many. Every year as the church winds down yet another liturgical year, we revisit this subject. Next Sunday is the last Sunday of the liturgical year in the Catholic Church. We call it Christ the King which just happens to be the name of one of my three small churches here in West Virginia. Now, in two weeks, we will be entering into a whole new liturgical season called Advent, which for the church is a season of waiting, not just for the baby Jesus at Christmas, but also for a second coming. It's an exciting time of the year because also the calendar flips. We're moving from cycle B, which is reading the Gospel of Mark, 
as we have all year, to cycle C, which is the Gospel of Luke. And of course, we all love Luke. Luke has prodigal son. Luke has got the Good Samaritan, the lost sheep, Zacchaeus the tax collector. Known as the Gospel of Mercy, Luke is great. He's on deck. It's going to be a lot of fun. Stick around. But today, we are still in the Gospel of Mark, and we are talking about the end of the world. In those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So these are pretty dark words, pretty ominous words, the end of the world. And then he starts talking about his own second coming. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And immediately, what does he talk about? Judgment. And he will send out the angels to gather his elect from the four winds. Why? Because life is a test. And at the end of this test, we will be judged for what we have done in this life. Or as scripture puts it, we will be rewarded according to our deeds. But then it ends with a very curious note. But of that day or that hour, nobody knows. Not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. A line, dare I say, that has created quite a bit of confusion about the divinity of Christ. So there's a lot to be talked about and unpacked here. So where do we begin? Well, let's begin, as we always do, by trying to put these verses into context. Because to really understand these verses, we need to understand Mark, the writer himself. Who is Mark and why did he write his gospel? So let's start with who is Mark. It may come as a surprise to some, but Mark actually was not an apostle. He did not follow around Jesus. Mark was a disciple of Peter, obviously a very educated man during a time when most people did not read or write. So very little was written down about anything. And when it came to Jesus, well, why write anything down? He was coming back like next Tuesday. I mean, that was the attitude. People were quitting their jobs praying all day in the synagogues. People were going crazy, causing Peter to write, those who do not work should not eat. So for about 20, 30 years, nothing was written down. And the good news was handed down only by word of mouth, or what they call oral tradition. Now I say nothing, but that's not necessarily true. There were some things floating around, but Mark was not a fan of these accounts because they over sensationalized the miracles. The focus was all on the miracles, the wonder miracle man that Jesus was. But here's the deal. In the ancient world, the wonder healers, the miracle workers, well, they were a part of the culture. And there were several that came and went, reducing Jesus to just one of many. But Mark knew better. Mark knew that Jesus was a whole lot more than a guy who did miracles. So he took the time to write a clear, concise, cogent account of the Jesus event as he presented the teachings of Jesus and explained what the crucifixion and the empty tomb was all about. Now, in doing so, he was presenting a message of self-empowerment and hope to a nation that was suffering. Scripture scholars believe that Mark wrote his gospel during a particularly difficult time in Jewish history. The Jewish nation was revolting against Rome, and this revolt would end up with the total destruction of Jerusalem and a leveling of the temple, which, by the way, Jesus predicted in the beginning of this very chapter, which, in case you forgot, we are in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, when he said, not one stone, not one stone will be left upon another. So there's a whole lot of social unrest. False prophet, prophets and zealots are rising up, claiming that they're the Messiah. Christians are getting killed. Things are in a pretty precarious state. 
And out of the depths of this sea of anxiety rises the Gospel of Mark. Beginning with the line, in the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, or the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Which you gotta love because he starts with a conclusion. Now we know that both Matthew and Luke will heavily rely on Mark as well as another source called the Q source, which has been lost to history. And, well, we know that John threw away the notes and started over again, but he certainly was no doubt quite familiar with the Gospel of Mark. So one could say that Mark pretty much set the template upon which the entire good news rests. So Mark sits down and writes the good news. Now, let me just say in passing, if you've never read the Bible for yourself, if for whatever reason that's not your thing, the Gospel of Mark would be a really good place to start. Now, in my own Bible, my version, the entire Gospel of Mark is 13 pages. I mean, that's it, 13. Can you imagine? 13 pages that could change the entire trajectory of your life, just sitting over there in the bookshelf, not read. So here's my question. Why do you suppose that's the case? How is it that the Bible, which is the best-selling book in the history of the world, is at the same time a book that nobody reads? Why, why do you suppose that's the case? It almost seems like there's a force in this world that is keeping us from wanting to read those 13 pages. Just saying. Fight the force. Read it and read it in a row. It's important to see the whole picture instead of just cutting out small pieces here and there. In those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is what is called apocalyptic or eschatological literature. It has its own unique writing style and it's all about the end of the world. Like I said, a subject that fascinates many. Now, we are in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, 13th chapter, and we are in a section called the Final Discourse. This is the last time that Jesus will talk to his disciples before he is arrested and crucified. So you know it's important. We can think of, of this as kind of like a symphony that's been playing for almost three years, that it's finally reaching its crescendo, that one crashing note, boom, here it is. But here's the deal. These people that are following Jesus, who think he's Messiah, have a very specific idea as to who and what a Messiah ought to be. And let me tell you, dying on the cross ain't on the resume. They're looking for a Messiah that's going to deal with their issues right here, right now. They're looking for a Messiah that was going to build an earthly kingdom. Somebody who is going to deal with the corrupt religious leadership and return Israel to its former glory. That's what they're looking for. And now we have Jesus, who they think might be the Messiah, and he's talking about the end. So once again, the disciples are stunned, which by now seems to be almost a perpetual state. Like I said, the beginning of this chapter begins with Jesus looking at the temple and declaring, not one stone, not one stone will be left standing. And of course, two the practicing Jew, that detail alone marks the end of their nation. But is it really the end? Because right away we read, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of the sky, which does not sound like an end to me, but rather a beginning. Remember now, we're in the final discourse, which we've noted in the past, would certainly be about the most important things. And what does Jesus choose to talk about? Judgment. Which I understand is a very cold and prickly word. We don't like judgment. As people, we're not fans. But Jesus makes it very clear more than a few times that in the Father's time, this world and everything in it will be judged. 
Like I said, we're not big fans, but truth be told, we are subject to judgment all the time. When a man seeks the hand of another man's daughter in marriage, you best believe that first dinner with the father. There's going to be a few questions, as there should be. And the responses to those questions will be judged. If someone seeks an advanced degree, let's say a doctorate, anything, let's say chemical engineering, they have to write a thesis about chemical engineering. You know, foot, footnotes and everything, right? And, and that paper is going to be judged by a panel of three experts who know a whole lot about chemical engineering. And their judgment, the panel's judgment, will determine whether that person gets to call himself doctor. If you feel sick, what do you do? You get a blood test. After the blood test, what do you got to do? You got to wait a couple days. What are you waiting for? You're waiting for judgment. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chap. You stick around. We'll be right back and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. A monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with and I will send you a monthly newsletter and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal, and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, just for the break, we were talking all about judgment and how, truth be told, Although we might not be big fans of this word, we're judged all the time. Now, to have judgment, you must at the same time have truth or parameters, a sense of what is right and what is wrong. Without that, you can't have judgment. You know, I, I, I had mentioned the blood test. Recently, I had a blood test done because my leg had become infected, just a little bit, but it was causing concern. And so I had to get blood work. And when my blood work came back, my SED rate was 22, and my CRP was five. Now, I have no idea what that means, but my doctor does, and he told me it was good news, and that it was well within the parameters indicating that the infection was gone. Now, if there weren't parameters, then how would I ever know? Meanwhile, this world is trying to sell you on the idea that there's no such thing as absolute truth, which means there's no parameters, which means it's meaningless. And that's a lie, because there are parameters. There is good and evil. Some things are true for everybody. Without it, judgment would be meaningless. Everybody would be a doctor. You could turn in any thesis paper you wanted. You could write whatever you wanted to write and call yourself a doctor. But we know better, don't we? Regardless of your religious beliefs, I think we can all agree that there is, in fact, a right and a wrong. And this right and wrong will be judged. This goes to the heart of Christianity. Beginning with John the Baptist, crying out from the muddy banks of the Jordan, what did he say? He said, repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is at hand right now right here. Repent. That word metanoia translates as a turning away from. You're going this way and now you're going to turn this way. Now the prerequisite for repentance is shame. Without shame 
repentance is not possible. I mean, think about it. Why would you repent unless you felt guilty about something? John the Baptist cried out, repent and believe in the gospel. The kingdom of God is upon you. And you know what? I mean, a lot of people responded to this. He struck a collective chord in the nation of Israel, and they all streamed out to the banks of the Jordan. Why? Because there was a collective anxiety among the people. My friend, take a look around. That's our world today. There's a whole lot of anxiety in our world today. But here's the rub, okay? They heard the message and they were moved to repentance. What about us? What about you? What about me? If John the Baptist showed up today at the Potomac River in Washington, D.C., or maybe the Hudson River in New York. W would crowds be lining the shores? I'm thinking no. Why? Because we live in a world that denies absolute truth. And therefore, there's no shame. And without shame, there can be no repentance. Meanwhile, as Jesus is coming to the end of his earthly ministry, the crescendo of his final discourse. The most important of things, what does he talk about? He talks about judgment. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and they will gather his elect from the four winds. Gather his elect. That is judgment. Learn the lesson of the fig tree. When its branches become tender and, the, and they start sprouting leaves, you know that summer is near. Now you can go back to the 11th chapter of Mark and read all about that fig tree, which represented the nation of Israel. But the bottom line is that it wasn't bearing fruit and Jesus curses it, begging the question, what about you, what about me? Are we bearing fruit? Never let us forget that we are being tested. Something is watching. Something is discerning. And when the time comes, something will judge. Soon Advent will be upon us. He is near. Meanwhile, a battle is raging throughout our world, while at the same time, we seem to be asleep. And let me tell you what, my friend. You start bringing up words like repentance. <laughs> you start talking about judgment. Lord, have mercy. You're not one of them Christian fundamentalists, are you? Not one of them right-wingers, are you? I guess here's the rub. If I was to walk outside and stand on the sidewalk and ask the average person walking by, do you believe there's a life after death? I'm thinking most people are going to say, yeah, I do. Now, the logical question to follow that question up with would be, well, what do you think is going to happen to you? And I imagine after maybe a short nervous laugh, I would get some version of, well, you know, I'm a good person. I hope to go to heaven, you know, whatever that looks like someday. But then there's another question. And this question is a question that is never asked. And that is, who gets to say if you're a good person? Who gets to define that? Is it you? Because, you know, if you're good enough, well, that's good enough, I guess. But if you're not, it would be an eternal shame. And my friend, forever is a very long time. Given the magnitude of this question, it is truly amazing how little time most of us spend thinking about it.
kind of gets back to that whole 13 pages thing, you know? <laughs> Almost like there's this force in the world that's trying to keep us from thinking about this. And that force has its reasons. Because if it can distract us for some 80 or 90 years, it wins the war. Why? Because you never showed up for a battle. So my friends, you might find yourself wondering, am I good enough? Let me save you some time. There is no such thing as good enough. If there were, we wouldn't need Jesus. But we do. Jesus came to this world to save us from our worst enemy, which in case you're wondering, is yourself. That's what the cross is all about. The cross is Jesus saving you from yourself. And if you accept that cross, both judgment and sentence have already been carried out. So in the end, it really all comes down to two questions. Do you need a savior? Or do you still think you're good enough? You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? Because the best vitamin for a Christian is B1. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you enjoyed what you heard today, consider Daily Living with Father Chapin in book form. Every homily for a year following the Gospel of Matthew. Available today in paperback, hardcover, or Kindle ebook. Download at Amazon. Daily Living with Father Chapin. Reflections on the Gospel of Matthew. <music>